Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Every touch is a step forward. By Dexcom, take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. And by No Foods, no grain, no gluten, no guilt. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, when diabetes isn't the only diagnosis, professional snowboarder and founder of Riding on Insulin, Sean Busby, talks to us about living with T1D and lupus. The main thing for me has been just working on building a support group, reaching out, finding other people that either have type 1 or have lupus. And so that has helped me the most with dealing with the ups and downs of dealing with both diseases. Sean has a doozy of a diagnosis story, and we'll find out more about the new Now You See Me campaign going on through the month of May. We'll find out more about riding on insulin by going behind the scenes with Molly Busby. Not every kid after riding on insulin is like, I want to do this every weekend. That's fine. It's just like the experience of trying something new with people who get you, that that's where the power comes from. And in our No Better segment, a new study about adults, type 1, and other autoimmune conditions. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your health care provider. Welcome to Diabetes Connections. Welcome back if you're a long-time listener and really glad you found us if you are brand new. We aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes. My son was diagnosed when he was not yet 2. He is now 13. And my husband has type 2 diabetes. I don't have diabetes, but I have a background in broadcasting, in radio and television, in local news. And that's how you get the podcast. We took part in Riding on Insulin last January, uh, 2017. I mean, really last January. And we wanted to go again. But the closest winter camp to us, this was the skiing and the snowboarding that they do, is in Virginia. And the date was Benny's Bar Mitzvah this year. So we missed it. But it was a blast. As you'll hear, Riding on Insulin is about many things. It is about getting kids with diabetes and their siblings out in the snow, skiing and snowboarding. It's about Ironman competitions and triathlons and and endurance training. It's about summer sports. Uh, We have a great event coming up in the Charlotte area. And it's about being with people who get it, you know, trying new things, having fun with people who understand diabetes. You know, neither one of my kids were ever on skis, and the counselors and staff did an amazing job. So we're going to talk about riding on insulin, but this interview is mostly about a new campaign called Now You See Me. Many individuals with type 1 diabetes will develop another autoimmune issue within their lifetime, things like celiac disease or thyroid issues, or as you'll hear for Sean Busby, the founder of Riding on Insulin, lupus. Individuals with these diseases walk around with invisible issues 24-7, and in the month of May, Riding on Insulin is going to highlight facts and stories of individuals living with multiple diagnoses, and I am happy to help get the word out. Diabetes Connections is brought to you by One Touch. Handwriting your blood glucose levels is the ultimate throwback. The One Touch Vario Flex Meter seamlessly syncs with the free One Touch Reveal mobile app to create your dynamic electronic logbook. And when you choose the One Touch Reveal mobile app, you'll be joining thousands of other people living with diabetes. In fact, as of this past October, One Touch Reveal was the number one downloaded diabetes management app in the U.S., Canada, France, and the U.K. To upgrade today to the One Touch Vario Flex Meter, and One Touch Reveal mobile app, visit diabetes-connections.com and click on the One Touch logo. My guest today is Sean Busby. He is the founder of Riding on Insulin. He is a professional backcountry snowboarder who lives with type 1, and he travels the world. I mean, he travels to remote quarters of the world to snowboard. Uh, While he was training for the 2010 Olympics back in 2004, he was diagnosed with type 1. It is a doozy of a diagnosis story, as I mentioned earlier, and he will share it with us. Sean has since become the first person with type 1 to backcountry snowboard all seven continents. 
Holy cow. Sean and his wife, Molly, live uh, in Montana. They live in a yurt. We're going to talk about that. I'm actually talking to Molly just a little bit later on, more about riding on insulin. She is our community connection this week. Sean lives with lupus as well, and it was that double diagnosis that got him and got the folks at riding on insulin talking about you know, living with more than one chronic illness. So all this month, they are going to be doing a campaign called Now You See Me. And May is Lupus Awareness Month as well. So look for that hashtag, Now You See Me, and I'll link it all up at diabetes-connections.com. Here's my interview with Sean Busby. Sean, welcome to Diabetes Connections. It is great to talk to you again, but first time for the show. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. There's a lot to talk about here, and I'm going to see you in person, I guess, really soon. You're coming to Charlotte for our Whitewater Center. This is new for us, certainly, to have Riding on Insulin in Charlotte, but this kind of camp, this bike uh, event, is not new to Riding on Insulin. Let's just jump in and start talking about that. What do you guys do during the summer months? When I know you do a lot of, of skiing and snowboarding during the winter, but what goes on in the in the summer? That's a great question. So, we are an action sports organization that caters to kids, adults, teens, all ages, families that live with type 1 diabetes. And so not only do we do ski and snowboarding camps, but we also do mountain biking. Um, we also have an endurance program. So we have people that, you know, they run Ironman, they do marathons, half marathons, or even 5Ks or family fun runs. It's for anyone that wants to be involved to, uh, with a great cause to help support our mission to serve more kids and teens living with type 1 diabetes. So we just kind of encompass all action sports. We're, that's what we're good at is the action sports market. So that's what we focus on. So this event that we have coming up on May 19th, that's in partnership with the JDRF. Uh, JDRF is one of our uh, partners uh, for this year as well as next year. And we're really excited about that. So we'll be out at the Whitewater Center there in North Carolina, and this event's going to be a blast because we're going to be doing whitewater rafting during the first part of the day. And then the second part of the day, we're doing mountain biking. So we'll have our coaches out there um, working with the participants. And this is open to all ages, so kids and adults. And uh, just looking forward to coming out to that area and and getting to, you know, meet a bunch of cool people. I'm so excited. We're signed up, um, both of my kids, my, my son with type 1 and my teen daughter, who's usually rolling her eyes at, at diabetes events, but she really wanted to go to this one. So thanks for putting it on. I think it'll be great. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. But I, I know that, you know, you started writing on insulin in part because, you know, to do this kind of thing for kids and get them excited, but almost to give back as well. Because I've heard you speak and how you're inspired by these kids, because you weren't diagnosed as a kid, right? I mean, you were a pretty young person, but you were diagnosed, what, you were 19? Yeah, that's correct. I was diagnosed when I was 19 years old. Um, I'd been competing professionally with snowboarding. I'm, I still am a professional snowboarder, but um, I was uh, competing full time. I was traveling all around the world. And this was in the winter of 2004. And I, re I remember that winter, I began getting some symptoms of like, some mysterious illness or a sickness. And, you know, I just thought it was, I caught some weird bug that some of my teammates brought back from Europe and that it was normal, but it kind of, it progressed to get a lot worse throughout the season. And then it really came down to me in the springtime. I remember I was at the uh, U.S. National Snowboarding Championships in Breckenridge, Colorado, and after my event, I came back to the uh, condominium that my teammates and I were staying at, and I just began vomiting uncontrollably. And again, just thinking it's some weird bug, but I had never felt this sick before. And so I called my parents, and my parents, they live in California, and I was like, Mom, Dad, I'm really sick. I don't know what to do. Like, how do I go see a doctor? Because I don't, I don't know those <laughs> things because I've never been sick. And they said, okay, well, you, you just go to urgent care or you go to the emergency room, but you probably just have a bad bug. Why don't you wait 24 hours? And one of the reasons they said wait 24 hours was uh, because they also knew that I had the next day, I was supposed to be leaving up uh, for Quebec, Canada for the Canadian National Championships. And they know how badly I wanted to finish my season strong. So they were supporting me in that aspect. So I decide, okay, yeah, you, you know, mom, dad, you're, you guys are right. 
I eventually got some sleep and I woke up. I felt a lot better. I went to that competition up in Canada, had no problems. But once I returned back to Colorado, the problems were all there, all waiting for me. I remember <laughs> it was, uh, you know, now it's kind of later springtime. The weather is all over the place. It's snowing one day. It's 60 degrees the next day. It's, it's just chaotic. And uh, we were doing our, we do training every morning. And so we go up on the hill and train and I would come back from my trainings around lunchtime and my roommates, they would notice that I would go to the grocery store before I came home and I would come home with just a bunch of liquids like grape juice, oh, all yeah. sorts of different sports drinks, all that sort of stuff. And they were like, Sean, you're always coming home from the grocery store, but never with any food. You're just coming home with liquids. And I'm like, guys, I'm just, you know, I'm training really hard. It's hot outside. <laughs> I'm just really thirsty. And so then I would drink these like gallon sized oh. jugs of grape juice and <laughs> I would get extremely ill. So that's when things really started coming together that something was definitely wrong. That's so scary. And uh, yeah. I'm trying to think what finally got you to the doctor? <laughs> drinking all those grape juices. <laughs> uh, so much vomiting was occurring that I finally went to the emergency room. Uh, but the emergency room told me pretty much the same thing that I thought was going on was, you know, you've been traveling the world with your teammates, your teammates have had weird bugs, you just got some weird stomach thing from them. And they would prescribe me some anti nausea medication to take. And they said, you know, of course, if symptoms come back, come right, come back in. And I ended up going to the emergency room seven times within, I think it was like within nine days. Mm. It was on that seventh visit where a doctor came out, took a look at me and instantly admitted me into the hospital. And I was in, in the hospital for 12 days and I had developed a severe case of pneumonia. So that really helped keep me in the hospital for that extra long time was I had a severe case of pneumonia from all the vomiting that was occurring. And um, on top of that, I lost 30 pounds of my body weight while I was in the hospital for those 12 days. So I went down to, I was 19 years old and I pretty much lost all of my muscle uh, by that time. My body just ate it all. And I went down to 119 pounds. I looked just like a skeleton. My hair fell out. Oh. I was just really, really sick. And then that's when I discovered the importance of uh, good health insurance and, uh, Thankfully, I had been taking some college courses uh, through a, a college um, back in California via correspondence uh, and online. So I was able to maintain myself under my parents' insurance. But the problem was, was that I was out of network and we had a really high deductible. So the hospital basically, you know, they worked on stabilizing me. My family took me out to California. I then saw a doctor in California. Um, just a random doctor, and I was put through a test called the glucose tolerance test, um, which if you know anything about type 1 diabetes, you don't really, you sh I, I would imagine you don't put anyone through the glucose tolerance <laughs> test if you suspect them of having type 1 diabetes. There was blood work that came back from the hospital in Colorado that showed that I had ketones and, and everything. So, um, and just to interrupt, just the, that is the path. glucose tolerance test, I'm trying to think, that's what they do when, like when I was pregnant, you drink that really sugary drink yep. and that's the glucose tolerance yeah. test. Yeah. That's not something you yep. would want to do. Holy cow. No, no, it was, it was horrible. I only remember the first part of the test. I think I pretty much just passed out for the, the remainder of the test when they came back for the final blood draws and, uh, yeah, so I was told that I would be given uh, the results within 24 hours. 24 hours came. Uh, we got a call from the nurse. The nurse said, Mr. Busby, your lab results came in. Um, everything appears to be fine, so you're good to go. How about that? Of course, he was anything but good to go. And in just a moment, we'll hear how Sean finally got the diagnosis that saved his life. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And when we look at the Dexcom throughout the day, as we have for more than four years now, it's incredibly helpful to head off highs and lows and help us help Benny manage his diabetes. But we also love Clarity, the diabetes management software system from Dexcom. It's an easy way to keep track of the big picture. And I check it about once a week. It really helps me dial back and see longer term trends and helps me not to overreact to what happened for a day or an hour. I can do that. 
I kind of overreact sometimes. Well, you get that overlay report that helps put context to patterns, and then you can set clarity reports right to your care team. It really helps prioritize the issues that you need to either fix or pay more attention to. It's good stuff. Find out more at diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Now back to Sean Busby explaining what happened after doctors mistakenly told him he was good to go. We have a family friend who's a, he's now a retired cardiologist. And he was like, no, 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 no. To my parents, he's like, your, your son doesn't go from being a professional athlete, completely healthy, to all of a sudden extremely ill. Yeah. Uh, why don't you go and ask for a copy of those labs and send them to me, and I'll send them to some of my colleagues. So we went down there, went, picked up the lab, saw that everything was marked abnormal or high and notified the nurse. She went back up to the doctor. The doctor came out. He apologized. He wasn't sure why we were told everything was fine because indeed something was going on. Yeah. And he basically he sat uh, my mom, father, and I down in his office and he said, now, Mr. Busby, don't worry. I've dealt with plenty of people that have type 2 diabetes. Oh, my so gosh. So here's what we need to do. So, yeah. I didn't know at the time I was being misdiagnosed as a type 2 but I knew nothing about the disease and I was completely healthy all my life. So I was just like, okay, cool. I got a diagnosis. So just teach me about it. Teach me what I need to do to manage this so I can get back out there and be a professional athlete. So I went home. I did everything the doctor said. Nothing seemed to work. Everything like my blood sugars just kept rising. And then they put me on an all protein diet because I still couldn't hold food down. And then I was, uh, they put me on, they added some different pills, some like type two medications and still nothing was working. And I just thought, you know, this must all be in my head. I grew up in a soccer family. My father used to coach college soccer. And so I was just like, I grew up in that, like that whole mindset of visualization and it's all in your head. And so that's why the medicines weren't working. So I figured, okay, maybe if I get back to Colorado, get out of my parents' house, then these medicines would work. And so three months later, I go to do that. I'm getting on an airplane out of uh, John Wayne Airport in California, and I nearly passed out. And I was taken off that airplane and rushed to a teaching hospital over at UCI in Irvine, California. And I, that, there I was given the correct diagnosis of type 1 diabetes Oof. on my mom's birthday three months later. <laughs> and cow. that first shot of insulin, I'll always stand by this as that first shot of insulin was the most amazing feeling that I've ever felt in my life before. So um, then I knew I actually had the correct diagnosis. And now I had this whole medical team to teach me about it. And so I could learn about it. And I went home, I did more research, I came across the JDRF. And I read these stories at the time on the JDRF website of um, every two years, they send kids and teens from across the United States to go to Washington, D.C. to speak to members of Congress on Capitol Hill to why we need to find a cure for type 1 diabetes. It's, it's an event called Children's Congress. And anyways, during this time when I got this correct diagnosis, I would just go and click on the JDRF webpage and press refresh. And I would read a new story of a kid that is talking about their life with type one. And there, I was able to read a story, parents talking about how when their seven-year-old spends the night at a friend's house, how they go and check his blood sugar in the middle of the night. I read a story of a 16-year-old that when he goes on a first date, like how he has to explain to his date why he has to give himself a shot of insulin. And here I was, I was 19 years old and around me, I thought, you know, my world was crumbling, but then looking at what my life had actually been, I was 19 years old. I traveled the world for snowboarding. And really the only thing I ever had to worry about was like, if a, a girl in one of my classes liked me or like <laughs> a pimple that was on my face. So it showed me like, man, if a, you know, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, a 16-year-old could do this and surely so could I. And it really inspired me. And, and I forgot to mention, like, during that misdiagnosis, I became really depressed. I had a lot of my snowboard sponsors drop me that support my career because they saw me as chronically sick athlete. In fact, I had one sponsor that said, Sean, we can no longer support you. You're, you're, you're just chronically sick. Like, we can't support that. 
And so it was really depressing because I, I just wasn't sure why, you know, the meds weren't working. And that just was because I had been misdiagnosed and I didn't know any better. So this really inspired me and it showed me, man, if these kids can do it, I definitely can do it. Surely so can I. So they inspired me and I wanted to find a way that I could give back. So that's where riding on insulin originated out of. I was like, if I'm going to be maintain myself as a professional athlete with type one diabetes, I now need to learn this new part of my body and learn or learn about my new body and how to function at this high level of an athlete. And so I wanted to use that as a way to, to give back and to, to teach other kids and teens. And then what I ended up finding was that at these camps, uh, at riding on insulin camps, just like any diabetes camp, I'm a big fan of any camp, summer camps, whatever it may be, you actually get to feel free of your disease because you get to be around a, a lot of other people that are just like you. And it's really inspiring. Before we go on to talk more about riding on insulin, because it is a remarkable story. You do so many great things for these kids. But I've wondered, because I've, I've read your story before when you talk about that first shot of insulin. Do you remember what it felt like? Can you talk us through that a little bit? Because, you know, I don't have type 1, and I know my son got better, but he certainly couldn't articulate mm -hmm. it at 23 months. What was that like? Oh, man, I just describe it as the best feeling in the world. When I describe it to other people that have diabetes, I'll just, I try to explain it. Imagine like you've had keep like any times if you've had ketones where you've had them for so long and you're just fighting it, you're, it's a sick day. And there's that fine, there's that final breaking point where it finally just clicks over and you feel like you're going to win the battle again. Mm. Um, I don't know, like that's the best way I can describe it. Um, for someone that doesn't have diabetes, imagine the sickest you've ever been. Let's just say, you know how that kind of feeling that sometimes after, if you're sick and you vomit, how you feel really good afterwards? Yes. <laughs> well, times that by times that by like a thousand at least. And that's what the first shot of insulin. I mean, I instantly felt my, I, I, my body was no longer eating itself. Like I could feel that nutrition coming right in. And that's, I knew I had been correctly diagnosed just off of that feeling. It was, a, it was an incredible, amazing feeling. You know, but it also illustrates, and I appreciate you trying to put it in words for those of us who don't have type one. It is tough. We don't speak that language. You know, we, thankfully, I'll be honest with you, we'll never have that feeling. And so it just goes to your mm -hmm. point of having to be around people like, you know, who are like you at riding on insulin at camps and things like that. It's really just amazing. When I see my son in the community that he's, he's built with camp, I know it's, it's a language that I will never speak. And I'm so grateful that you all have found ways to find each other. So how did, how did you start going with riding on insulin? Did it, did it work out quickly right away? You said, hey, let's do this. And then everybody jumped on their skis. You know, how did it go? <laughs> I like to call it back then as a ragtag operation. So I would call up children's hospitals or um, diabetes groups and just be like, hey, my name's Sean Busby. I have type 1 diabetes. I'm also a professional snowboarder. I would love to run a clinic basically for your kids or teens in your, at your program and teach them how to ski and snowboard and manage their blood sugars. And so that's how it started. And then uh, at one point I did a camp. There was about 75 kids that showed up and it was like basically just myself. So <laughs> then that's, uh, <laughs> things drastically changed since then. Um, since then now, uh, right on insulin is, a, is an official nonprofit. We have a staff of three other people spread out across the United States and Canada. It serves over 500 kids a year. Um, we have programs all across the United States from West coast through the Midwest to the East Coast, across Canada, as well as a few programs in New Zealand and Australia. Wow. One of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you this month is because May is, and this is going to sound a little different to my regular listeners, but this is Lupus Awareness Month, and you're someone who also lives with lupus. So, you know, let's talk about that a little bit, because a lot of people with any autoimmune condition like type one, unfortunately, often have another. How did you find out you had lupus? Well, remember that complicated diagnosis story I just brought you yeah. through? <laughs> one of the things that made it also really complicated was they noticed a bunch of abnormalities going on in my blood work. So they weren't sure what was playing on what, what was causing what, if, the, if my blood sugars were so high because of something else and, and all that. So eventually, once I got under that really good care team in California, they started kind of investigating all those different things. And 
eventually that led them to send me out to Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. So I went out to the Mayo Clinic for two weeks and went through a barrage of testing. They were testing for everything from uh, multiple sclerosis to Addison's disease. Um, I even spent a good amount of time in a cystic fibrosis clinic. So just trying to get everything kind of back in line and figure out what was going on and what all these abnormalities that were happening and why the reason they were. And how I went from a completely healthy individual to someone drastically so sick um, at the age of 19. So um, they concluded there. At the time, I came, I came to the Mayo. I was sent to the Mayo Clinic. I was on some high doses of a steroid called prednisone. Um, because I had severe hives that were occurring on 70% of my body. They'd been occurring for uh, months on end, never a day of rest of them. Anyways, prednisone is a, is a drug also used to treat lupus, and it, mask, it can mask um, the symptoms of lupus. It can mask the blood work, and lupus is also a very complicated de- uh, autoimmune disease to diagnose. In fact, lupus is usually uh, mainly only seen in women, but one out of 10 people that have lupus are men. I believe there's only about 150,000 men in the world that have lupus. So I got that lucky little lottery <laughs> ticket. But uh, <laughs> anyways, um, at um, Mayo Clinic, they said, you know, there is something definitely going on. We can't put, it's not showing its face yet. We uh, believe it's a connected tissue disease. Um, it'll probably show itself in 10 years. So um, anyways, I got the diagnosis at 11 years. I was up in the Arctic Circle of Norway on a snowboarding, a backcountry snowboarding expedition. And I, uh, when I came home, I just had these insane headaches that made it feel like I was going to go into a seizure. Um, I had this gnarly rash all over like my face, my chest, my back. And then like, there's a bunch of abnormalities going on with my muscles. And so I, you know, I went in, got to check up with my doctor, just to make sure like the, the brain stuff wasn't, you know, something like uh, cancer or anything like that. And, um, they noticed, uh, that something was attacking my muscles. Something was attacking my liver. Um, actually, uh, about two years prior, I had to have an emergency liver biopsy because they thought I had a a uh, disease called autoimmune hepatitis, which is a auto, it's another autoimmune disease, but uh, lupus can imitate that. It's known as the great imitator. Yeah, one thing led to the other. Um, I was then sent to a neurologist. A neurologist sent me to a rheumatologist, and he looked at all my paperwork. Um, one of the main things that I had in my blood work was something called anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies, which means I produce antibodies against my own DNA which is primarily only seen in lupus. And then I also had something called, which are called complement levels. My complement C3s, complement C4s were all low. Um, I had some proteins spilling out into my urine. So like there's some kidney involvement. It was just basically the gold standard lupus diagnosis. So now I go out, I actually fly, I live in Montana, but I fly out to Baltimore uh, to Johns Hopkins uh, to see the lupus center out there. And that's where my, uh, I, I have a, a lupus doctor here in Montana, as well as one back on the East Coast. You know, you mentioned earlier that you were suffering depression and, and obviously really feeling down before you had your diagnosis of type 1. I think a lot of people would look at what's happened since and wonder, are you depressed now? You know, that's a lot to handle. If you don't mind me, and I know mm-hmm. that's a very nosy question, but you know, how are you doing? How do you how do you handle those dual diagnoses? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. On one end of the spectrum, I've had all these bizarre medical things going on for years that we haven't been able to put a face to. It's really nice to be able to put a face to this and know what my enemy is that I need to keep battling um, instead of not knowing and just just having it attack my body silently. So that has helped. But I mean, definitely just like diabetes, anyone that has a chronic disease is going to face depression at some point or like burnout from it. One of the hardest things that I faced with it was to me, lupus is kind of like having diabetes, but with every organ. So lupus can attack your brain. It can attack your kidneys. It can attack your liver, your muscles, your skin, whatever. And I feel that diabetes set me up for success at least because it got me in the ball game at least for 
or on the playing field on how to deal with a chronic disease, mm-hmm. that there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs. And I definitely have been learning a lot. I get a ton of downs with, with both diseases. But then the main thing for me has been just working on building a support group, reaching out, finding other people that either have type one or have lupus. And so that has helped me the most with dealing with the ups and downs of dealing with both diseases. But at the same time, I got it. it at sometimes I can see lupus as like being a worse disease for me, but I can't look at it like that. I have to look at them as both pretty bad diseases and I got to treat them as equals because if I choose to focus on my lupus, then I'm ignoring my diabetes, which is going to cause all sorts of chaos. And uh, so it's just like basically they're kind of like my children right now (laughs) until (laughs) my wife and I have children. That's what I'm learning to manage. And every day is kind of a new adventure with it, but I'm getting better at it. And I have a great support network that I can reach out to of people that are going through the exact same stuff. And so um, that's what's helped me a lot. I've met so many people with type one who have something else going on as well, celiac or, you know, another autoimmune issue. And we have a lot of autoimmune stuff in my family. Um, And I'm just curious, you know, we, we do now talk about type one a lot, but I, it's harder sometimes to open up on those other things. There just doesn't seem like the same support. Have you found that to be the case? Yeah. You know, I think I noticed I've had a hard time kind of bringing that up at certain events. It's always kind of like if I do bring it up, it's in kind of the right timing. Mm -hmm. Just because sometimes I find I get to deal a lot with a lot of new diagnosed families. And so they're already being overwhelmed with that. And so sometimes it can be kind of tough to be like, there is a chance now that your child is predisposed to get something like celiac or hypothyroidism or another autoimmune yeah. disease. But I do feel like it's important to talk about because it helps generate the conversation um, around it uh, of just being able to to meet those other people that may not be talking about it that need someone to talk to. So for me, by, by doing that, I've been coming into contact with a lot more people to help build my support group um, that have been helping me through the dual diagnosis sort of deal. And I think, again, it, you know, one of the, the best doctor I've had was the one that correctly diagnosed me for obvious reasons. That's why it's in the best. <laughs> but the other thing, within the first month checkup, he looked at me and he said, Sean, do you ever cry? And I just started bawling. And I think that was important to recognize that, again, no matter what, a, what chronic disease it is, you're going to have those hard moments. And you, to be able to talk to someone is what's going to actually help get you through it so that you can take better care of yourself in the long run. So again, it just creating that conversation, talking, being open. I mean, I see kids that come to camp that have celiac and I'm like, wow, how yeah. do you do that? And at the same time, like, again, while, when I just said, like, I don't want to spring that information on a newly diagnosed family. However, I'm seeing kids like this deal with two conditions or three or maybe more, whatever it may be. And that is so inspiring because they're still going about, they're kicking butt at, and doing the things that they still want to do and love and they're just managing it. And that's all it comes down to. It's just learning how to manage it and just be consistent with that man. Yeah. Well, you mentioned your wife a couple of minutes ago, so let's talk about Molly um, because the two of you, in addition to this, all this stuff with the kids and the diabetes, and everything, you've been featured on HGTV and DIY, you know, because you live in, do you still live in a yurt? I mean, you're living off the grid, right? Tell me about your, tell yeah. me about your 16 chickens and your turkeys. <laughs> oh, we got more than 16 chickens. Oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. We live off the grid. Um, in the winter, we have to snowmobile home. And we have to haul up our own water. We also do rain collection, but we can't do that in the winter because it's northwest Montana. It gets really cold here and very snowy. And um, we have we power our stuff with solar power. We heat with wood. So it's just, I grew up in Southern California. I grew up right next to the beach. I had a concrete backyard. And so I wanted to have a bunch of skills. I wanted to learn a bunch of skill sets at some point in my life because um, I never got to learn them where I grew up. And we just kind of, fell in love with that lifestyle. Um, Molly's originally from Wisconsin. She uh, used to be a camp counselor as a 
you know, as a young adult every, every summer and stuff. So they just kind of fit naturally with uh, kind of our styles. And we like to do a bunch of backcountry skiing and snowboarding expeditions all across the world. I've, um, I've backcountry snowboarded on all seven continents. Um, so a lot of the places we go to are also like third world countries and stuff. And um, we've adapted different parts of various lifestyles from all those different places that we, that we cherish and that we love um, to kind of also blend into our daily lifestyle too. Uh, so it's just something just kind of unique and quirky, I, I guess, about the Busby's. <laughs> it must be spectacular, though. I mean, how beautiful. Uh, I mean, is there anybody it's near fun. you? <laughs> uh, there is. Uh, we, you know, town is two miles away, so it's it's not that far. It's just all of our systems are completely off the grid. We're self-sustainable um, with what with what we're doing. And then, yeah, we have open space and land. We have a ski resort um, that's not too far away. Glacier National Park, you can see it from our property. So it's gorgeous. We get nights with the northern lights and all that. And um, we're actually going to be spending our summers also because of lupus. I have a a severe sun sensitivity. I'm basically allergic to the sun, like UVA and UVB Mm. light, but high amounts and high amounts of heat. Um, So Montana, we've been getting tons of fire. Like our fire season's really long now. Um, we're getting lots of smoke from the fires and we get a lot of abnormal, unseasonable heat now, like months of like a month solid of over 90 degrees, which just isn't typical for this part of Montana. Yeah. And uh, and that's when my lupus comes out of remission and becomes super active. And we want to make sure that I can help prevent things like chemotherapy to treat the lupus and all that. So we're actually going to be moving to Alaska for the summers. Even though there's 24 hours of daylight, the UV isn't as high as down here in the continental U.S. Um, so we'll be doing summers in Alaska, winters back in Montana, and that will help manage my uh, my lupus as well. That just sounds beautiful. I mean, it's a horrible thing, I know, because of why you have to do it. But man, Alaska is so spectacular. I assume you've, you've been there before. Yeah, and uh, I'm actually going there next week on a snowboarding trip, so... Um, Alaska is, it's a beautiful place and it gets to combine the two of my favorite things, uh, where we'll be, um, down on the Kenai Peninsula, you got mountains, which I love. And then the ocean since I came from Southern California. So it is a, a beautiful place. So we don't mind that. And, uh, it, it'll just be really good for my overall health as well. And you're still snowboarding. Yep. Still snowboarding full time. <laughs> wow. That's great. Is there a time... Yeah. When you're out there, I can't imagine that you think about all of this every day, right? When you're out, you're snowboarding and you're kind of in your head as you are when you do these kinds of sports. But is there a time when you're doing this and thinking, I can't believe I'm still here and I'm still doing this? I mean, you must just have these moments of, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would think some overwhelming joy and kind of that that fear of what could have been at the same time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm definitely... uh, Type getting diagnosed grounded me and it, it showed me basically how to cherish my true passions and, um, the things that I have. And so I, one of the the beauties of riding on insulin is the fact that I get to go out now and work with kids throughout the year. And I get to get inspired by them because of the life they're living in hell. And like, I, I got a I got an Instagram message yesterday from a kid that learned how to snowboard a couple of years ago at one of our camps and is now competing nice. in snowboarding. And wow. like that is so cool. Like you, you came and you learned a new sport and now you're taking it to the highest level that you can. Like that's amazing. And so I get to to do that with all these kids and people that live with type one. And now, now that we have adult programs, cause I, we recognize the importance, like I'm an adult. Some of our staff members that have type one diabetes are adults. Like it's also important to do events for them too. Cause we still have the disease once you don't grow out of it. It's just been an awesome experience and getting the, you know, the combined snowboarding or mountain biking, just getting to be outdoors with others that have it has been one of the greatest things ever. And actually I think my, most favorite accomplishment with riding on insulin is we now are doing uh, artificial pancreas clinical trial camp. So my big thing with snowboarding, with backcountry snowboarding, has been going to all the seven continents and pioneering 
uh, peaks, like going and climbing up peaks that have never been climbed before and being the first person to snowboard down them. And so like this whole pioneering attitude. And now with riding on insulin, these kids are coming to camp and these teens are coming to camp and they're getting the pioneer new technology that will help move us to at least the mechanical cure for type one. And what's awesome is that's just coming from kids that are out there skiing, snowboarding, mountain biking, and doing our camps. And that's been my, the biggest thing I, I think I cherish from uh, riding on insulin yeah, is the fact that this organization awesome. is helping to move a cure forward. Before I let you go, what should we keep in mind for this event in Charlotte? I mean, this is pretty much for any riding on insulin event, but what should me and my kids think about? You know, what would you like us to think about before we show up? Anyone that comes to our event to think about at that event, like who are you going to meet? Who are you going to meet that's going to, that you're going to be able to have an impact on or that they're going to be able to have an impact on you. I, t- I tell all of our campers to go out, make friends because everyone that is there understands exactly what you're going through. And again, I, I say the next best medicine to insulin is a community. And so I just want people to, to remember that this is a community disease. All, any, any chronic condition requires a community around of support in order to help those people live with their disease. And it's not just the person living with it, but it, it impacts the whole entire family. As parents, or as siblings, everyone has their own perspective on what it's like to have someone in the family that has that. And so just to know that you're not alone, that you're all out there and we're all working towards the same exact thing to help find a cure and to be able to treat and live with this disease successfully. That's fantastic. Sean, thank you so much for chatting with me. I really appreciate it. You have an incredible story. Thanks for sharing it. And I'll see you in Charlotte soon. Awesome. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. You can learn much more about Sean's story. You can learn more about Now You See Me, the hashtag campaign that's going on all month long, month of May, with Riding on Insulin, talking about living with more than one autoimmune disease, along with type 1 diabetes. And we'll be talking to Molly Busby in just a moment with more information on riding on insulin and what happens in a day, that sort of thing, and and a little bit about our experience there. I heard Sean's diagnosis story when we went to riding on insulin last year, and it still boggles my mind, not only how so many healthcare providers missed it. You know, we've heard that story before so many times with adults who have type 1, they're misdiagnosed with type 2, or you, know, you just have the flu, or you, you know, something else is going on. And it amazes me that he saw so many who, who misdiagnosed him. And frankly, it, it amazes me that, that he survived in as good health as he is. And that may be inappropriate to say, I don't know. But that's what I think of every time is, my gosh, what a story. And, and the fact that after all of that was said and done, that he didn't just decide, all right, I'm taking care of me. You know, that he continues to do so much with the community. Um, I'll look forward to seeing him um, really in just a couple of weeks here in the Charlotte area. And hopefully we'll have some fun. I say hopefully because, uh, you know, I'm about as coordinated as this microphone stand right here. So it'll be interesting <laughs> to see what happens. I think they're going to get some of the parents doing stuff, too, at the Whitewater Center here in Charlotte. Time now for our No Better segment. And this week, talking about a new study showing type 1 increases the risk for other autoimmune diseases in adults. No Better is brought to you by No Foods, delicious, clean, nutritious. They are grain, gluten, wheat, soy, dairy, peanut, yeast, and guilt-free. How do they do it? How do they make waffles and breads and uh, muffins and croutons that taste delicious and have no grain or gluten? Well, they use superfoods like chia, flax, almonds, egg whites. It is yummy stuff. I had the cinnamon cookie, one of my favorites, and a cup of tea last night. So that's always yummy to munch on. And I, I just like their food because, you know, going gluten-free can be difficult, right? That transition is something that I don't know anybody that, that gets a diagnosis or has that advice from their doctor, like I did, uh, you know, to go gluten-free and says, terrific, can't wait to get started. Mmm, that gluten-free bread is so delicious that I've heard so much about. Because let's face it, a lot of it's gross. But I have found no better foods to be terrific. So give them a try. The waffles 
fantastic, uh, really great stuff. You can check them out at diabetes-connections.com. Use the promo code STACY10 to save on any purchase. When you go to a diabetes conference, quite often you'll see, uh, speaking of of gluten-free, you'll see um, a gluten-free table because a a lot of people with type 1 do have celiac disease. But it it turns out, and you you may know this anecdotally already, that a lot of people with type 1 also have another autoimmune condition. Uh, Celiac is an autoimmune condition. uh, So is thyroid disease. So is lupus, as you heard Sean talking about. So this is an interesting study that came out just about a month ago, Washington University Diabetes Center. It was a six-year study that ended in 2017, and this was about adults. These researchers note that most studies before have focused on kids with type 1, but they found in this study that people with type 1 diabetes onset after age 40 had twice the risk for one or more autoimmune conditions, such as thyroid disease, uh, gastrointestinal immune conditions, twice the risk as those diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in childhood. This was a relatively large study of more than 1,100 adults with type 1. Slightly more than half were women. And in the results, more women than men did have other autoimmune conditions. I'm not going to go through every detail of the study. I will link it up because there's a lot of really interesting information and a lot of numbers here. But the upshot these researchers say is that if you are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes after age 40, and they do note that it's very difficult to get that type 1 diabetes diagnosis correct, and when you're an adult, because it is often misdiagnosed, that you have to talk to your doctor about these risks. You don't want to let it go where they're not checking for other autoimmune conditions. So talk to your doctor about thyroid disease, especially these researchers say the one condition that every newly diagnosed type 1 patient must be screened for is thyroid disease. But you want to talk to your doctor about other autoimmune diseases, especially when diagnosed in adulthood. Not a happy study, but the idea here is to get the information, use it to your advantage, find out what's going on. Perhaps it can help you figure out if there's an issue before it becomes something that is really detrimental to your health. No autoimmune issue is fun. I have one myself, but getting it under control, knowing what you have is so important. And now you know better. Our community connection this week is Molly Busby. Now, she is Sean's wife. Molly likes to say Sean is her husband. And as I said, we participated in Riding on Insulin in January of 2017. This interview is from then. And I apologize for holding on to this for so long. But sometimes these things happen. There is nothing here that is dated or does not hold up. And I mentioned at one point that Benny had some difficulty. Um, I will come back and talk more about that afterward. But I wanted to include Molly in this because she has such great things to say about caregiving, about taking care of yourself, and more information about riding on insulin. The whole goal is helping kids feel normal for the day. Um, despite living with type 1 diabetes or being somebody that supports somebody with type 1 diabetes. Um, Bringing people together with action sports is what we do. I was living in Wisconsin um, in 2010, and I my background is in journalism. I lived my whole life there. Um, and my colleague, Michelle Allsweger, um, her son, Jesse, lived with type 1. And so we worked together at a women's magazine. You know, I didn't know anything about type 1 diabetes. I didn't, nothing, nothing like this has ever crossed my family's path. And so in February of 2010, Michelle's son, Jesse, passed away. And he was 13 years old. And at the funeral, um, everybody was talking about, you know, this snowboarder that was coming in to give the eulogy. And I was like, you know, I've never met this guy. Michelle talks about him all the time. He came into these camps for Jesse in Wisconsin. And at the end of the day, she introduced us at the funeral. And that's where we met. So, you know, it was a little bit of an instant connection between us. And then we kind of kept in touch and we were dating. And eventually I moved out west to be closer to Sean. And I said, you know, 
at Jesse's funeral, you vowed to restart riding on insulin, this, this thing that you did. And my background is in summer camps. I've lived and breathed summer camp for like 15 years of my life. So I was like, I think I could like, I think I could help you with this. So we got hooked up with a group in Utah and we did the first camp in December of 2010. And then it was just like this snowball effect. So then we went to Wisconsin and Michelle helped us get that going. And then we went to Colorado and then we went to New Zealand and just seeing the impact that these camps, these one day camps for kids and their siblings with type one, just how big of an impact that made. And it's at the end of the day, it's really not about becoming a pro snowboarder or a pro skier. It's, it's about being together and learning a new sport or enjoying a sport that you love. Um, me personally, I, didn't re- I grew up kind of skiing in the Midwest, but it was just a steep learning curve once I met Sean because <laughs> that's just part of the fun. Sean had already done a little bit of riding on insulin. Was it similar to what it is now? I assume it, it, it's grown, but was it at its core what it is now? Yeah, so originally Sean just started out, he wanted to give back to kids living with type 1 because after he was diagnosed at the age of 19, he needed a little bit of inspiration and he read stories on JDRF's website about kids going to Children's Congress, which is an amazing um, opportunity for kids around the country to go you know, help advocate in, in Washington for um, type 1 diabetes research and and things like that. So he read those stories and was like, wow, if these kids can do it, so can I. So he wanted to give back and riding an insulin was the way that he wanted to do that. So, you know, we call it back in the day, you know, Sean would work with a a diabetes hospital or like Michelle actually helped Sean um, do camps in Wisconsin and and Sean did camps in Idaho with a great camp, uh, Camp Hodiah out there and camps in California. So he, he would like work with different groups, but he took a break for about two years to go back, finish his bachelor's degree. So that's when I met him was, you know, after he'd gone out and got a quote unquote real job and <laughs> had just kind of given it up. And so we said, no, this is important. We got to get back to this. So I know the first question I'm going to get from a lot of people is why can they come to my area? How can I get them here? What do yeah. you have to do? Well, right. So writing on insulin is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we have there's about five of us working full-time year-round to make these happen. So it's not it's not something we take very lightly to go to a new region. There's a lot of really important things that need to happen. Number one, we have to have a really great resort. There's a number of resorts that we work at. Um, Wintergreen here in Virginia is is a pretty great resort. Um, Whitefish Mountain Resort in our hometown, Montana, they gave us amazing deals on lift tickets. So does Wachusett Mountain in Boston, um, or outside Boston, rather. And then there's just a number of other resorts that really want to work with us. That is key. Um, secondly, we really look to... Um, diabetes families and diabetes groups, diabetes camps, because there's not like a a newspaper that goes out to everybody with diabetes that we could like advertise in. So we really rely on word of mouth. It's very grassroots. And so if we don't have those contacts, if we don't have groups of people that we can send out info and try to convince to come skiing and snowboarding with us, then we won't have people. And then of course, what every nonprofit says is funding. So it costs us somewhere around $555 per child um, over the course of a year to serve them a camp as in the way that we do. Um, We put a lot into making sure that we have mentors at our camps that have type 1 diabetes. So we have a team of over 35 elite coaches, all with type 1 from all over North America. And we either, they drive out to at least one camp a year, and then we usually fly them to at least one because we want to make sure that we have trained staff out on the mountain with the kids who not only know type 1 diabetes, but also are passionate about skiing and snowboarding. So to fund that, to help subsidize that cost for families, because, I mean, we, of all people, we know, you know, the cost of type 1 diabetes is kind of a lot. So we want to keep the cost low for camp, and the way we do that is fundraising. And so we work with a number of local partners. Um, we've worked with the University of Virginia in the past. They're very big supporters of us, as well as our pharmaceutical partners. Um, the Helmsley Charitable Trust has been a big supporter of us. So really local groups, um, like, for example, Beyond Type 1, a lot of people know them. They're a huge supporter of us, but they have basically, along with the John Madden Foundation, have underwritten our Tahoe camp. So that's why we were able to go there this year. So that is really, really amazing. And the Uni- University of Virginia, um, we partnered with them in a number of ways last year. And so we were really motivated to come back to Virginia to kind of serve this area. And um, yeah, we're just always looking for those those things. So if people are interested, best thing to do is we, have, we actually have a form on our website. If you want to camp in your area, we want to hear from you because 
The only way it happens is if you start. And I'll link that up at diabetes-connections.com so people can check it out. Can we talk a little bit about the diabetes aspect for these kids? Because for a lot of parents, this is maybe the first time where they are doing an activity like this, which is a high-impact activity without Mm -hmm. the parent around. Yeah. So I know all the checks that you do and everything. Can you go through that a little bit? Totally. So... You know, uh, skiing and snowboarding with diabetes is not an easy task. There's a number of factors happening at any time. There's the weather, there's potentially altitude, there's climate. Humidity can even affect all of these things. So we kind of wrap all this up in a way where we have a range that we, our medical team with Riding on Insulin has developed. And we keep our families, um, our kids, uh, between a range of uh, 120 to 200. Um, again, that that's not to say that's that works for everybody. I personally cannot give medical advice. However, we've found that when kids are in this range, it's safe for us to go out and ski and snowboard. Um, we have this rule that if you're under 100, you do not get on a chairlift. Um, if you've ever been on a chairlift, you know that there's always potential for that chairlift to stop, for a stop for an undetermined amount of time. And if you don't have glucose with you, A lot of our coaches have been in that position, and it's not fun. So we try to keep that safe. A lot of it on the mountain comes down to the common things you find with an action sport. So um, making sure that you have winter gear on, um, protecting your eyes, sunscreen if it's sunny and if you're at high altitude. So it's a lot of things that don't even have to do with diabetes. Um, So ultimately, I think... Diabetes is just another thing we have to prepare for out here, but the kids have the best time, and it never really matters what the weather is. <laughs> I want to talk about summer camp for a mm-hmm. sec because you mentioned that early that that was something you were really passionate about. Mm-hmm. That's a special kind of person because we all bring our kids to camp, and then we leave, Yeah, and you're there. See ya. <laughs> so what was fun about that for you? What appeals to you about I mean, your eyes lit up when I just changed the subject to summer <laughs> yeah. camp? Everybody who knows me from, you know, being a kid knew, like, I was the girl that went away to summer camp. I grew up on a lake, and my friends were always like, why would you leave? Like, why would you let go of that? And I'm like, summer camp is maybe who I am. And so I think for anybody, so I don't have type 1 diabetes. I consider myself a caregiver in a lot of situations. Being around others who are like-minded is so, so powerful. If you're around other people that like baseball or around other people that live with lupus or live with type 1 diabetes, it's going to make you stronger. And so for me, going to summer camp, being around other people that love summer camp, it just allowed me to be free and allowed me to be me. And I think a lot of times in schools or other organized groups, it is hard to be yourself because there are bullies. There are people that are going to put you down and turn off your light, so to say. And at summer camp, it's just a chance for everybody to be on the same playing field. No one really cares. We're all just getting dirty and not showering all the time and eating this awesome food and camping. And yeah, I I love the outdoors. So Well, and it's it's interesting. Sometimes the challenges we put in front of ourselves are there from ourselves, not from a bully Uh or anything like that. I mean, and I'll share my son this morning struggled with wanting to be great at snowboarding immediately. I, I think that was what the problem was, right? I mean, because he's never done it before, and he thought some of the little kids were better, and he got really upset. But your staff got him through that, and now he's yeah. back out having fun. Not to make me feel better, but I'll yeah. ask this. Does that happen often? Do you see situations like that, and your guys are going to train to help yeah. these kids? I think type 1 diabetes, I don't think. I know it puts a lot of pressure on a kid right away to no fault of anybody, to fault of the pancreas, right? So I think for them to come into something new, the expectation is like, okay, I got to do this. I got to be this. I got to be this person. But really our goal, like I said before, it's not creating a pro snowboarder or a pro skier. Like you're literally just going to learn something. And I will say not every kid after riding on insulin is like, I want to do this every weekend. That's fine. It's just like the experience of trying something new with people who get you, that's where the power comes from. And I think it sometimes it takes certain kids just a little bit longer to figure that out. But I was just talking to another family and we've never had somebody leave after lunch being like, no, this isn't for us. Like there are bumps along the road in the morning. Like, I don't know if I want to go out. I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I'm insert whatever your phrase is, but really like once you get out there, it doesn't matter who you are. You're having fun. And I have to say our coaches are 
the heart and the soul of what we do other than the kids, of course, but like those coaches, they dedicate so much of their time volunteer. They fundraise for us and they are dedicated to, we call it spreading the stoke to more kids. (laughs) That's great. Yeah. We also had a parent meeting, which I thought was great. Mm -hmm. Um, A really good discussion. I always feel like I want to talk less during those things and my big mouth just keeps going, (laughs) but it's really nice. But you said something in there that I, would you mind repeating? You talked about as, as a caregiver yourself, how important it is not to just care for your your husband, your child, to make sure mm-hmm. that you're taking care of yourself too. Yeah, I think a big thing for Sean and I, I mean, we've been married for five years and I don't have diabetes. He does. And so for me, I learned a lot, as much as I could about it. And then you go into this mode and I think a lot of parents probably could really, you go into this like caregiver mode where it's just like, okay, we just got to survive. We're just surviving this next day or this next hour. And I'm just doing all I can, but like ultimately, and we tell our coaches this too, if I, Molly, am not who I need to be, I'm not taking care of myself, then there's nobody to take care of Sean. Just like, you know, if riding on insulin, if we didn't work in our off season to fundraise, there would be nobody to do these camps. And so it's just, you have to some, you have to at some point invest in yourself. Um, for me, uh, that's yoga. And Sean knows that that's, he's like, I see that you love that as much as I love snowboarding. And so it's like identifying what that is. And I, you know, you don't need to spend 12 hours a day doing you time, me time, although that's okay sometimes. Um, <laughs> but it's like, you really have to keep a little part of yourself because that's what makes you, you. And just like people with diabetes will say, my whole, half of our staff has diabetes. And so they'll say, diabetes doesn't define me. It's not who I am. It's just a part of me. It's a part of my life for better or for worse. And so you just don't want it to drown you. And I think that applies to caregivers, wives, husbands, moms, dads, brothers, sisters. Like it's not who you are. It's just a part of you. And speaking of brothers and sisters, you open this up to siblings, too. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit of thinking behind that? Yeah, I guess our mentality is there's a lot of uh, attention on the kids with type 1, on adults with type 1, on on anybody living with type 1 diabetes. But really, and I'm, I'm not downplaying the significance of type 1 diabetes in somebody's life, but I think there's something to be said for everybody around that person. And I know people with diabetes say this as well. Like, it's a team effort. If you're going at it alone, which can be said for anything, is if you're going at it alone, it's going to be harder. If you have a team, if you have like-minded people, people that are supporting you and loving you, ideally in, in the way that you need to be supported, you're going to be more successful. And just like there's no I in team, same thing applies to diabetes. And so for us, like we don't care if you're a sibling, if you're a best friend, if you're whoever you are, um, whoever's supporting the people with diabetes, they deserve to come to Riding on Insulin because we're all one happy family. That's great. Hey, Mostly you. happy. Mostly. <laughs> <laughs> there's the hard days, but we end, every, we're all winners, we're all happy. Sean always says, it's, everything's like sunshine and rainbows for me. Molly's terrific, and I I know this is audio only, but man, her face lit up when we started talking about camp, and uh, I thought that was great to see. She's she's wonderful. More information, of course, at diabetes-connections.com. And, you know, the story about Benny, about my son uh, being reluctant, it was so funny because on Friday night, it's usually a Friday night and a Saturday day for these snowboarding and skiing camps, uh, they have a reception, and Benny was super excited. He couldn't wait. He met everybody, and he was running around the room, and so how old was he then? He had just turned 12. It wasn't that long ago. So he was 12. And my daughter uh, was with us as well because, you know, siblings can come. And she was kind of reluctant. She didn't really want to be in the middle of the social stuff. She's much more introverted than the rest of us. And there was a lot of like, oh, diabetes again, eye rolling stuff. But the next morning, she was excited, jumping out of bed, you know, couldn't wait. And he was really nervous. And I think it did turn out to be where he was worried that, hey, there are little kids here who ski better than me. I've never done this before. But he got very discouraged. And it all came down to his meter didn't fit well in his snow pants we had borrowed. We don't have snow pants. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. You know, we go snow tubing occasionally. We wear jeans. You know, it's like... 55 degrees and we're snow tubing. We're obviously not big winter family. But that really put him over the edge. And I can understand that it was so frustrating. But luckily, I stayed out of it. And they did such a great job of encouraging him, getting him where he needed to be, getting him out there. And 
everybody had a blast. It was fantastic. So thanks so much to Riding on Insulin. We would have been there again. In fact, we were talking about trying to arrange um, our family vacation around their their uh, weekend, or, or I think it might be a couple of days in Montana. Because wouldn't that be amazing? Gosh, it's so beautiful out there. But uh, the timing just didn't work out for us. But we'll get out there someday. So if you'd like to learn more, of course, I have it all linked up. I'm excited that Riding on Insulin is doing summer stuff. I'll let you know what the experience is like here in Charlotte when we do the Whitewater Center Riding on Insulin with JDRF. Okay, so where am I going to be? Yeah, uh, that, that event is coming up in May. That's here in the Charlotte area. I'm just back from Touched by Type 1. I'll tell you more about that next week, but uh, as we're taping before, I'm leaving, uh, but I'm sure it's going to be great. And then uh, this week, as the episode is coming out, I will be in Boston for a very brief blogger conference that Lily is putting on to show us their new uh, technology. They're entering the device market. And so far, they're still letting me go, even after last week's episode. Um, listen, I shouldn't laugh. Thanks for all the feedback about our conversation with Lily. I really felt like, um, you know, frankly, we didn't get the answers I was hoping for, but I do feel like we pushed a little bit past the public relations lines we often get. And um, yeah, pricing will definitely come up this week at the conference. I can't imagine talking about these devices without talking about pricing, access, and of course, pricing of the insulin that goes in them. In May, as I mentioned, we have the one challenge with riding on insulin. And then in June, wow, I just looked at the calendar. Diabetes camp kicks off for Benny, which I don't have to do anything for, which is always a nice week. And then in July, Friends for Life and Orlando, uh, back to Orlando for more diabetes events. And we will be talking about how you can get involved with our game show modeled on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. That's a fun one, and we'll be doing that show, taping it live at Friends for Life, and listeners can win prizes, so I'll be letting you know more about how to enter to win on that. If you'd like to have me come to speak to your event, just let me know. Drop me a line on social media or at stacy at diabetes-connections.com. And you know what? If you've listened this far and you haven't yet subscribed to the show, maybe you're still listening on social media or the website, and that's fine, but go ahead and grab a podcast app. And subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher if you're on Android, that sort of thing. It makes it really easy. You never miss an episode. It just pops up on your phone every week. So please go ahead and subscribe if you're listening on a podcast app or go check that out. It's a great option to help you make sure that you can listen every week without fail. Thanks to my editor, John Buchanan of Audio Editing Solutions. I like to thank him every week because he does such a great job of stitching this show together. All these moving parts, you know, when you have an interview that you just did, an interview from last year, other stuff like that. Thank you, John. It is an honor and a privilege to do this show every week. I love it. Thank you so much for listening. We are coming up on three years of this podcast in June. How about that? I'm Stacey Sims, and I'll see you back here next week. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.